We are so excited to be joined uh, by one of our favorite guests here on Pod Save the World. He's a British member of parliament. He's the author of the book Tribes. David Lammy, it is great to see you. Thank you for coming back on the show. Not at all. Um, and I'm coming back at one of the most exciting times in our recent history. So I'm very pleased to be with you. Well, we're so thrilled to have you. Uh, our brains are mush. We do nothing but watch cable news and refresh Twitter. Uh, and it's so nice to have a real conversation. So hypothetical question for you. Uh, an authoritarian leader is demanding that authorities stop counting ballots that were likely cast by his opponent's supporters as a way to buy time to throw an election into a judicial system that has been stacked with his unqualified lackeys. What does the UK government do about it? <laughs> The UK government condemns it. You know, the UK government joins with partners in the European Union and speaks loudly with one voice. The UK government I mean, defends the democratic tradition. So what the hell is going on is your question. We, <laughs> we, we are so silence. smug. <laughs> we are so smug in the United States about how we talk about foreign elections and democracy. And then, you know, we're, we're not exactly cleaning up uh, our, our own mess here. H how do things look? from the UK. What is the average person in, in the UK thinking about this election right now? It's important, I think, for folk to realize that all over the world, people at this moment are getting a lack of sleep. They are glued to their TV sets. They are glued to social media. Um, they uh, are, you know, really, really focused on whether Joe Biden has just done it. Um, you know, the global community know a lot about US elections. There's a lot of analysis. We also understand the important role of the Senate. Um, and we can see that that's not looking as good as people thought. Um, and I guess um, America plays or has traditionally played an important role as being notwithstanding the issues that arise, of course there are issues that arise. I remember the counting chads uh, not that long ago, but an important role being a beacon for democracy. So what is really worrying is not just the sort of gerrymandering around court cases and you know the, the delaying the inevitable, but actually when you look at, and I saw some images coming, coming to us overnight of people um, chanting, stop the vote, stop the vote, stop the vote. That yeah. is frightening uh, to, to particularly to Europeans and, and all over the world. It, 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 it sends exactly the wrong message, despots, dictators, and those. So David, I wanted to ask you, uh, the question of American credibility is an interesting one because on the one hand, I think we all sense America's lost something these last four years in terms of its standing in the world, that people were concerned not just with Trump, but the fact that you know this country could elect Trump and this you know the world just saw a lot of Americans vote for Trump again. On the other hand, like you just said, people around the world are watching this very closely. Uh, they still seem to care about what happens here, uh, you know, for for a variety of different reasons. Let's assume for the moment that that Joe Biden can squeak this out. Um, and the world just saw the United States not repudiate Trumpism. It wasn't an overwhelming result against Donald Trump, but they may have just seen Donald Trump defeated and the American system kind of hold and Joe Biden get in. What do you, what is, where does that shake out in terms of, of what the state of American credibility is in the world and, and America's capacity to speak up, you know, for democratic values or to take on issues like the pandemic. How, what is an America led by Joe Biden after this election look like in the eyes of the world as, as both a leader and as a, a, a leader on behalf of a set of values? Joe Biden's election marks a reset and it's a reset where the global community in very, very turbulent economic times, very turbulent times as a result of the pandemic, but also turbulent times globally because of some of the issues in Russia, um, in China and the Middle East. Joe Biden represents a return to normality. Um, he represents for many um, the opportunity to get back into the room on the issue of climate change, hugely important 
the most pressing issue facing so many across the global south, particularly. Um, in the Middle East, I think, returning with, with, with Europe on issues like Iran, I think some of the decisions that have been made in relation to Jerusalem and Israel have caused much frustration and anxiety. Um, and I think that in tough economic times, the absence of America's leadership in mobilizing in terms of how to deal with this, in terms of fiscal stimulus, in terms of support, um, a, a sort of a, 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 a coming together in terms of finding a vaccine and mobilizing across much of the global community, particularly in poorer countries. I can't tell you how absent the United States has been. And of course, it's not just the United States. Here in the UK, we have been so inward looking as a result of the decision to leave the European Union that, if you like, it's an absence of the Anglo-American uh, voice. And I, I, Joe Biden marks the return to the debate. Now, you can have differences of opinion about what policy decisions you then take as a result of that. But the point is, America has not been in the room. And sometimes America has been shaking the foundations of the room. So worrying has it been over the last few years. Well, yeah. And, you know, you and I have talked about these topics a bunch, but I mean, I, I wanted to just, you know, ask you about two of the, the, the most worrying trends that we're seeing in America that are replicated abroad, you know, that are very connected. One is this kind of authoritarian trend, you know, nationalist authoritarianism that we see. You know, with Trump, you know, you had Nigel Farage appearing with him at, at rallies and you've got people chanting, uh, you know, stop the count. And and clearly America, even if Trump loses, still has this kind of virus of authoritarianism present and nationalism present that is, you know, fed Brexit, that has fed movements in Hungary and Poland and other places. And at the same time, we see here that it's connected largely also to race. They're, they're chanting stop the count where the people who voted are black and and you know you sit in you know the shadow cabinet of the labor party as a leading opponent of uh i think you know the kind of crude nationalism of, of brexit and you also you know are one of if not the most prominent black member of parliament in, in the uk what what is what what is your advice to americans about how do we take on these issues not just globally but at home like what are you seeing that we need to be doing better to fight both authoritarianism and racism and the way those things come together. So look, let me just come back to basics here. My personal view is that there are two hugely important engines of the world. One is the largely black and brown engine of the global south. People that work so hard to manufacture so much that we wear, that we consume, that we use for very little. Um, when those folk get upset, there are civil wars, um, sometimes terrorism, but basically the world continues. And then there's another very big engine. It's the working class engines of Europe, um, of North America, uh, particularly. It's often white. Um, when they get upset, <laughs> uh, people sit up. And to be yeah. very serious, we can get some very serious global wars, in fact. And the truth is we're having this conversation and we have been now for several years at a time when artificial intelligence, changing technology, um, the rise of the East and where things are manufactured, affecting jobs, an aging economy, huge inequality across our societies, the pressure on that traditional community is intense. And the way you deal with those problems require, you know, Herculean effort, big brains. Uh, let me point to someone who's not in my political tradition, but I think is broadly doing a good job at the moment in really getting into the weeds on those issues. Let's pick Angela Merkel. So that's the serious way to address these problems. And I have no doubt that if Joe Biden is elected, he'll get into the serious business with Kamala Harris of dealing with these issues. There's another way of dealing with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the other way of dealing with it is the populist way. <laughs> the other way of dealing with it is culture wars. Um, is find any red herring, any excuse to pick another issue. 
um, you know, it's the Supreme Court. We need to fix it. We need to get, <laughs> ram someone in there. Um, um, it, you know, it's Black Lives Matter. It's 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 it, any these other reasons. The other immigrants pick on them uh, to 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 address those issues. And those things are never going to. These are not the heart of the issue, right? These are these are uh, setting up straw men. Uh, deliberately stoking problems. And that's what we've seen Donald Trump doing. We have to call it out. We have to be better. Uh, I think particularly actually at this time, this is a time that calls for progressive parties to be really clear on their economic message, by the way, um, and economic credibility. And I, I, I worry that sometimes that is getting lost particularly in a discussion where it's do you lock down an economy or open up an economy we've got to be heard on our economic message we've got to we've got to own the future you know where are those jobs going to come from um the language that we use has got to be you know when people talk about a green new deal not everyone in the communities i'm talking about hears that as being anything to do with them you know what are those jobs real in real time for me right um so those are those are those are big big issues, and yes, we attend to those huge issues of inequality, huge issues of racism and structural discrimination that still in, uh, exist in our society. But look, let us not lose the plot because um, these central issues of identity, and I'm obviously very associated with fighting for rights for black men and women here in the UK cannot be the beginning and end of the conversation, right? That, that you know, we have to get into the business of the, both the economic and social environment in which working people find themselves and what we are doing to support them and their families at a time where we're losing jobs and we seem to be losing power to other parts of the world. You know, building on that sort of cultural question, I mean, one of the ways that America seems to constantly lose the plot and get distracted by sort of, you know, sideshow cultural issues is because of Fox News and conservative media. Yeah. And Ben and I have had a, a really interesting conversation uh, previously with uh, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd about the damage caused by Rupert Murdoch and his publications specifically. Absolutely. If if you look at Australia, the UK, the US, you see the far the uh, the Tremendous rise of the far damage. right in those places. Yeah, not in Canada, for example. I, I've I've sort of noticed recently that there have been attacks on the BBC in the UK. I mean, what what is the state of the media in the UK, and, and how are you guys fighting off these sort of rabid right wing news outlets? Well, the two things: his empire, um, a not 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 a centre right agenda, um, a hard right agenda an anti-immigrant agenda, and very worryingly, let's be clear, an ethno-nationalistic agenda. Whether you're in Australia, whether you're in the US and you see the appeal of Donald Trump, or indeed whether you're in the UK. So that is the agenda being driven by these outlets. I'm afraid it's not great here in the UK because lots of people want Fox News here in the UK. and We've got some experiments about to begin to bring that to us in real time. And then alongside that, you've got the huge challenges of social media and the huge challenges of an unregulated, um, uh, uh, innovative uh, technology-based sector interrupting the market, also open to being um, manipulated by powers beyond us, like um, Russia, uh, uh, and somehow a convergence of interests <laughs> with some of those forces within our own country. Um, that is a very worrying landscape. It will need stronger regulation. It just will. It, you know, in the end, this requires regulation. It requires entering into the market. It, it, the, go, going back to basics. I'm a lawyer. Back to basics on, on, on uh, sort of plutocracies and uh, competition rules. Um, uh, breaking up these huge powerful forces that can be so disruptive um, uh, because power is in the hands of one individual, two individuals or a few individuals and it's not it's not acceptable. Much greater transparency, much greater accountability and because this is a global issue we've got to work across borders. 
you know, we can't have the European Union off doing one thing, not able to have a conversation with the United States of America, when most of the technologies are based, by the way, on the West Coast. It's got to be a global conversation, and you've got to create sense consensus. I think there is consensus, by the way, that can be struck in that Joe Biden kind of cross-party sense of working with colleagues in the centre-right as well, by the way, uh, to forge a new path. And that's going to take a lot of hard effort. But you're right, at the moment, it's like the Wild West. It's like the Wild West. And there are some guys making a lot of money and pushing this national populist agenda. And, and so it's, it's very, very sad that despite, we hope, Joe Biden winning, um, I'm afraid the forces of Trump have not departed. He has not been um, eviscerated in this election. In fact, yeah. it looks like he's garnered more votes as well. Yeah. So speaking of you know that sort of nationalist populist agenda and, and how Joe Biden will deal with it, I mean, look, Bor Boris Johnson is a is a historically good shapeshifter, right? I suspect we'll hear from him if Biden wins all the same rhetoric about the special relationship. Hopefully there will be uh, uh, just loads of stories about the location of the Churchill bust because that was time well spent uh, during the Obama administration. But, you know, one thing he'll have to do is Brexit negotiations. Do you, do you think is Johnson re having to recalibrate in real time on Brexit negotiations? Like, how do you think that plays out going forward? Well, he knows that Democrats have been really clear about their concerns about the Good Friday Agreement um, and some red lines that simply cannot be crossed in, in relation to the situation in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, of course, uh, colleagues have long memories. Um, uh, and I think that probably Boris Johnson regrets some of the things he said uh, about former President Barack Obama. Uh, yeah. But I still think that our, um, you know, our interests coalesce. This is the UK, US interests. Um, returning to the room on things like Iran, things like climate change. Um, I think that there's a, 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 a centering opinion, particularly on, on China, uh, on Russia. Um, it, it, these, these are very, very important issues. And whilst I, I, I look, I, I'm one of Boris Johnson's most ardent critics. You know, I want him to succeed. We are leaving the European Union. Um, we do need to forge uh, a strong relationship with the United States and strike a good trade deal. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, in a, in a sense, um, I have more confidence in Joe Biden um, 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 than I did in your in your in, in Donald Trump. But I, but I, but I want Boris to succeed in that relationship. And the truth is, we know over many, many ye years that the relationship between the UK and the United States is bigger than the individuals who, who occupy those high offices. It just is. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I um, as one of the people who uh, remembers uh, Boris Johnson saying, for instance, that uh, Barack Obama um, Clearly, you know, the only reason he was showing up in the UK to counsel and advise our friends against Brexit was because he he harbored some Kenyan antipathy <laughs> against the British Empire. Uh, you know, we, we do remember that. But you're right. You know, what what Democrats really care about is is the Good Friday agreements in, in Northern Ireland and and, um, and in a way that Trump clearly doesn't. Um, I, I guess the question I had to just follow up on that, David, is that, um, you, you know, a lot's changed now and you have. Um, in some ways, you know, Joe Biden has described himself as a bridge to a new generation of, of Democratic leaders. And, and we hope that Boris Johnson represents kind of this gasp of Brexiteers in their, their moment. Angela Merkel, who I share your admiration for, you know, will be exiting the stage soon. And I guess as we look at, you know, a post-Brexit UK and Europe, and, and what is a special relationship with the UK out of the EU and how do we deal with these issues like disinformation? I mean, wh what do you want to see the bridge lead to? I mean, wh what, is the, what is the future of how the US and UK work together, you know, beyond Boris Johnson, even Joe Biden? Like, what, what should we be aiming for in terms of nations, you know, that hope to share common values and interests? Um, I know this is a very broad question, but we're at this kind of 
transitional moment here. You Be, know. Beyond beyond the individuals in the office, um, um, wh what is the macro? Where are we in, in macro terms? We've got a generation of millennials and Generation Y, very large generation, um, uh, you know, the children of baby boomers, who are set to inherit a settlement, you know, a social contract that's so much less than their parents, economically, um, environmentally, and the world is not feeling safe. Um, you know, it really isn't feeling safe. Um, and the UK-US alliance has to address those issues. Um, we, dis we touched on many of them um, in this conversation, but the, the, the UK, it has to be central to those issues. We've got to deal with climate change. Um, we've got to be really, really serious about it. We've got to level up issues of inequality. We've got to, we've got large populations that are aging and it looks like we're going to have less work for them. Um, so in terms of our education systems, our skills agendas, um, frankly, uh, um, I think, and I suspect you you agree with me, Ben, <laughs> Tony, doubling down on, on, on that sort of New Deal era of how you generate work that stimulates yeah. and keeps the economy going becomes really, really important. There's no point lying to people. There's no point, you know, fighting hard to uh, keep, you know, fossil fuels going, right? When it's just like, this is, this is the old world. We've got to get into the new world. Um, that's the partnership that I think our countries can play. Um, and there are some despots around. There are some bad people around yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, in, in, in quite powerful places globally, and they will need firm, hard challenge going forward. Um, uh, and I suspect the world, you know, the global community, organizations like the UN need leadership organizations like nato need leadership and 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 being together the g20 the g8 these are very very important and um we need to be at the table uh, and there's a new kind of there there are definitely new international agreements beyond climate change that had to be forged i've just raised one of them which is the challenge of how we deal um with some of these tech companies um social media and, 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 and clearly the regulation that we're going to require if we're going to keep our people safe, safe from loneliness, safe from mental health, um, safe from intellectual interference. That takes serious leadership and partnership. <clears throat> well, one last question. Obviously, one of the issues is climate change. And I know you have a project, you know, because I've been a little involved in it in Guyana, where, uh, you know, your parents came from um, to, to, you know, people may not know a lot about Guyana, but obviously it it connects to the Amazon. Um, there's also significant resources there in terms of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, why, uh, why don't you just tell the listeners a little bit about what you're doing there and, and why, you know, given all your responsibilities, um, uh, political and otherwise in the UK, both climate change as an issue is important to you um, and, and why this particular project in Guyana is, is important. To understand why climate change is important to me, I encourage your listeners to just Google my TED talk a few weeks ago uh, on the relationship between climate and racial justice. Uh, and to summarize, you know, if you marched and campaigned around Black Lives Matter, then please recognize this is not just in the sphere of criminal justice in countries like the US and challenges in the UK or France or, or Australia. Um, think about those Black Lives in the Global South. Who is facing those rising waters? Who is facing drought? Drought. Who is facing the burning of the Amazon? Uh, and it's because I feel very strongly about both the pollutants in urban cities like London, like you know New York, Chicago, and black and brown people breathing in terrible air, doing terrible jobs um, uh, in, in a sort of polluted environments, but also. Um, what's going on in the global south that I'm in this space. And in Guyana, here you have a country at the top of South America, um, English-speaking country, with wonderful virgin rainforests. 90% of the country is rainforested. Um, and we have to preserve that, particularly given what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in Venezuela. I have a project, it's called Sophia Point 
you can google it www.sophiapoint.com and we are trying to help protect their and conserve their rainforests but also not just climate change and carbon but zoonotics you know how do we how do we um find the science that's going to help us in future pandemics and um you know we're raising funds for the charity and i'd be really really grateful if any philanthropists listening who care about climate and um you know recognize the importance of the amazon basin not just in brazil but in guyana as well what want to contribute go to our go to our website listen to my ted talk email me you know strangely it's very easy to email a <laughs> member of parliament in the uk you can just google my name and put email next to an email me. <laughs> uh, well i mean it, it's such an interesting idea it's such an important topic i don't think uh people are sufficiently concerned about deforestation of the amazon we are not only releasing record numbers of CO2 into our atmosphere, we are actively destroying all the ways we can take it out. So uh, time is not on our side here. We got to move quickly. Uh, David Lenny, thank you so much for doing the show. Um, I, honestly, I feel better just having spent 30 minutes not refreshing uh, 538.com or, or whatever stuff I've been doing all day. So yeah. this has been... This You're going to go back to doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm going to go do it now as well. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I, 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 I always get to so, see you. So it's my sincere hope that very, very soon we're going to get a result. Where, can you just tell your global audience when are we going to get this result? I, I, there, I, it could be today. I mean, I, we're, we're hearing like it seems like they're about to call Nevada. Uh, the people, the campaign folks I talk to, think that the final Pennsylvania margin is like Biden plus a yeah. hundred thousand votes. So like things are looking very good. Trump needs to sweep all the remaining states, and it's not looking good for him. So and he's crossed. losing, and and he's probably losing in three of them. So I one, mean, the, the, one last the, question. One yeah. last question. Given the global community looking at what's happened in your Supreme Court which is deeply worrying and you know, the politicization we find very problematic. Um, should be we worried that if this gets into the court arena, somehow this can be whipped from the American people and handed back to Trump? I never say never with these people, but it does seem like a lot of these legal attempts by the Trump team are, are losing in lower courts. And if you have a scenario where Biden wins Arizona, Biden wins Georgia, Biden wins Pennsylvania, the idea of taking all of those results to a court, I think, begins to feel increasingly hard. And hopefully you'll see people in the Republican Party saying, we just can't do this. But I, I don't know. I should never um, underestimate their cynicism. I think, you know, David, the note of like optimism I'd sound is that like the, the the extremity of what Trump would be asking to do is set, you know stop counting ballots like that are being counted. It's not even like Florida in two thousand when it was stopping a recount. Um, most lawyers feel like there's just there's not like any legal basis for it. But I think the bigger concerning problem is that Supreme Court and the Republicans, if they hold the Senate, the capacity for America to do the kind of reforms to our democracy to address things like voting, to address things like representation are much, much harder. So the good news yeah. is it may not affect this election. The bad news is it, it may affect Joe Biden's capacity to, to set a better democratic example by fixing our democracy. We're with you, brothers. <laughs> yeah, 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 there's together. a lot we'll to do. Yeah, yeah, a lot to do. Global solidarity here. Global solidarity. Yeah, step one, get Trump out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again great for stuff. all your time. Thanks for the great work you're doing, and uh, we hope to see you soon. <laughs>